God's people said, amen. Let's just celebrate that. Can we celebrate that this morning? You already, uh, you've already preached the message. You've already heard it preached through word. We, we've heard it through, uh, through song, but now we just get to sort of sit in the midst of that. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. Well, good morning. I pray that your Thanksgiving was a, a wonderful one. I don't know how you cook your turkey. If you... I don't know, deep fry it? How many of you deep fry your turkey? How many fryers do we have? All right, three, great. Um, or how many of you like oven roasted? If you do tofurkey, I don't know what your thing is, turducken, uh, but I, I hope it was wonderful. I was just talking to my wife this week. This is weird, the things, the memories that kind of come up when you go through holidays. And you know, like when I was in radio, before I gave my heart to the, the Lord and jumped in full throttle. Um, I, I would, every, it was a Thanksgiving tradition for me at the radio station, the eve before Thanksgiving, you know Butterball Turkey has this hotline that's available 24 hours a day to help people with their turkey crisis, with the crisis that they have with the turkey in their life. And I would, um, I, <laughs> I would call and I would, it was my job, I would use different voices and I would try to push that Butterball Turkey operator to the edge of her sanity. I would do it every year. I, I have since, by the way, laid all of those things at the cross. I have asked for forgiveness <laughs> for all those things that I did when I was in the morning show. But Butterball, do you know that they actually publish a list of like the craziest questions that they get asked every Thanksgiving season. You want to know what the top three crazy questions for 2016 were? All oh, these make me so happy. Question number one, a guy calls and he says, yeah, I'm just wondering if the oil on my turkey, if it's going to be safe for me. And the operator was like, well, what do you, I don't quite understand. Was it an olive oil? What did you use to rub on your turkey? And he said, no, no, no. I, I used a chainsaw. I used a chainsaw to cut through my bird. And I'm wondering if the oil from the chain would be bad for me. That person is out there. They're driving around right now. They're real. <laughs> Question number two. 2016. I love that. <laughs> I love that this person calls Butterball and 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 they, they said, "Hey, um, and I don't know why everybody in my mind talks this way, but they do. Hey, um, I'm wondering if, <laughs> if this turkey is going to be okay." And the operator was like, "Well, why would it not be okay?" He said, "Well, I got it out of my dad's freezer, and the date on it said 1969." It's like that is a turkey is not a wine, so you need to just for whatever reason buy a new one, 15 bucks or last one. 2016, person called and they said, what, what should I set the dial? What number should I set the dial to to thaw my turkey? Operator does a little bit more questioning there and come to find out they had wrapped their turkey in an electric blanket and they were thawing it and they wanted to know. You know, we all have this kind of dysfunction that sits around us every holiday season, do we not? Come on, is, is there a reason why, like Christmas Vacation, why we love that movie and why? Because we all have an Uncle Eddie in our family. We do. Some of you may be Uncle Eddie. Well, what I love is that God moves in the midst of dysfunction. What, I what does that have to do with Jesus? You're already asking that. I got a good answer for you. Could it be that when Jesus said, you are my sheep, that he's actually saying, and this is true, sheep are not the sharpest tools in the shed. So praise the Lord that we have a good shepherd, that he guides us, that he moves. That's what this recalculating series that we've been in now for five weeks, it's what it's all been about. It's what it's all been about. Like, I love to see these moments where we just interact and we see God move. We started with the story of Balaam, this prophet who was being led by the motives of money and power, and God uses a donkey to redirect him and to guide him into the place that God wanted him to go. God can deal with hyperactivity in his people. We talked about Moses, Exodus 3. The very beginning, the burning bush, right? Moses is 80 years old. He's dealing with the murder that he had committed. He's dealing with the oppression of his people. And I love that quote, Elizabeth Browning, you remember? She said that all of earth is crammed with heaven and every bush ablaze with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. We talked about the fact that burning bushes are around us every day. I believe in the God of miracles. I believe that God is speaking. I believe God whispers and I believe God shouts every day. The question is, as it was for Moses, as it was for Balaam, as it is for us today, are we paying attention? 
are we looking? We talked about the paralytic, the beautiful story of, of these, these men, these friends that, that took their friend, that did everything they could, that, that they could do to bring him into the presence of Jesus. And Jesus healed him physically, but we also know this man had a spiritual paralysis in his life. And Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Jesus wants to see us healed, wholly healed. And then, of course, last week, Bob Hayes, come on, the story of the 10 lepers. If you missed it, you want to go back and watch it. And the one who returned to give thanks. Every one of these people, every one of these stories, a few of hundreds upon hundreds that you find in Scripture, people that had these recalculating moments. But we're going to talk about a party today that I actually think the more the Holy Spirit kind of led me to this particular passage of Scripture, it didn't make a lot of sense to me in the beginning, but you know, I continued to dig, and, and the more I got into it, the more I saw that here is a miracle. We're going to look at a miracle in John's Gospel, chapter 2. It's a story of the water being turned into to wine, and, and, and it's a subversive, it's a, it's a big miracle. It's the first miracle of Jesus, but it's a, a quiet miracle, but it's actually a much bigger miracle that a lot of people didn't realize he had done, but I think it's a good segue in transition from moving from this recalculating moment to a greater statement that Jesus is making that sets up Advent and where we're going to go over the next four weeks beginning next week, right? So what I want to do is I want to just pray for us. Can we pray real quick? And then we're going to dig into the story. I love, I love what God's going to say today. I love the context of this passage. I, I always preach. I always just say, God, will you preach it to me before I preach it to my family, to my community? And I love what God has been saying to me within the context of this. So let's just pray for just a moment. Heavenly Father, um, you are the God of miracles. You are. Father, you, you pursue us, God, that, that you walk beside us, you, you go in front, you stand behind. God, this, this breath that we have in our lungs, it's, it's, it's your breath. And God, you are, you are abundantly revealing yourself to us every single day. So Lord, I pray over the hearts that are here today. Father, I pray for those that are live streaming today. Wherever in the world they may be, maybe someone is podcasting this message right now. God, this is what I love about how you move, that any time we say, speak, Lord, your spirit will speak. That, Father, if we come into this place out of routine or whether we run into this place because we, God, we're empty and we need to be filled, you meet us exactly where we are. You don't beat us down and remind us how bad we are, but you remind us how much you love us, how much you've pursued us, how much grace and mercy you want to bestow upon us. But Father, you also call us to live a life that matches your life. That Jesus' sanctification is real. That, that God, if, if Christianity for us is showing up on Sunday for an hour and that's all we give you a week, we've got an anemic faith. So Father, challenge us. It's a dangerous prayer to say, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. But maybe that's where we are today. So God, wherever we are, just breathe a fresh word into us. Thank you for what you've done. Lord, we look back and we are grateful. I thank you for what you're doing, and God, for what you're going to do. May you be given all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise, as it's in your name that we say, amen. All right, if you have your Bibles, why don't you open them up? I'm going to be in the book of John today, John's Gospel. I'm going to be in chapter two. I'll get there in a moment. I tell you, I love, I love the Gospel of John. I've always loved the Gospel of John. I mean, I love all the Gospels. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I was talking to someone recently, and you know, I just assume you all speak church, right? But I should never make that assumption. Maybe you come in today, this is all brand new. You have no idea what's even happening within the context of God's word, and that's okay. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're four disciples that follow Jesus. Jesus said, follow me, and they basically write down, they, they, they kind of, they write the stories in a letter of what they saw Jesus do over the three years of ministry that he walked on the face of this earth before he was crucified and ascended. And what you find is some of these stories, you find them in different gospels. Maybe Matthew, Mark, and Luke would write them down, but some of them, you only find them in one. This story the wedding at Cana, where Jesus turns the water into wine, you only find this in John's gospel. And why? Because this is early on in Jesus' ministry. You don't find it in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. And the reason is because Jesus hadn't said the words, follow me, to them yet. Just John is following Jesus. And John's doing something amazing. Like Matthew, in the beginning of Matthew's gospel, Matthew was a tax collector. 
So he comes out of the gate. He gives the genealogy of Jesus. He speaks from that, from that tax collector perspective. He's detail-oriented. He loves facts. Uh, Mark was just matter of fact. People, Mark's gospel drives him crazy because Mark ends his letter with an empty tomb. He doesn't write anything about Jesus revealing himself to the disciples on the other side. Why? Because for Mark, it's like, hey, the tomb's empty. We've got work to do. We don't need to know anything else. He did what he said he would do. And Luke, from a physician's perspective, writes very much about healing and Jesus reaching the least and the lost. But John, something about the way that John writes. You see, John had this relationship with Jesus. He was close to Jesus. John referred to himself constantly as the one whom Jesus loved. You know, for the longest time, I used to think he was being a little boastful when he said that. John, the one whom Jesus loved. But the more you understand where John was coming from, when John would say that, the one whom Jesus loved, it just took his breath away. To think about God would put on flesh, would walk in the midst of, of humanity and would look at him and would love him. So John's reminder, his identity, was just this, the one whom Jesus loved. Maybe we need to rename ourselves the one whom Jesus loved. So John, out of the gate, in, in John's gospel, John chapter one, it's not on the screen, but let me just read the first five verses of the book of John. In John 1, John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In the very beginning, John begins to lay this foundation that Jesus was the Messiah. And he begins to tell all these stories in the very beginning, John 2, John 3, John 4, these miracles. In every one of the miracles that John says, there's some deeper meaning, there's a deeper truth, there's a greater symbolism that's going on. So think of these stories, these miracles that you find in John's gospel as bricks that lay out the foundation to say Jesus was who he said he was. And that sets up where we are in John chapter two. This amazing story begins with these words. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. And Jesus' mother was there and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Hashtag crisis alert. Now, this is a big deal. Why is this a big deal? Now, I don't know. You know, when you, when you plan a wedding, first you understand that Mary and Jesus, they were, they were guests of the bride and the groom, okay? So there were family. Weddings in this culture, first century culture, they, they weren't just one night and then everyone would go home. Do you realize that these weddings would sometimes, the celebration would last for a solid week. They would go for a full week. And it was the job of the bridegroom to make sure that he provided for his bride. So all of the details, all of the plans, all of the organization, it fell on the bridegroom to make sure that everything was paid for. And here's what happens. If something fell apart, if something wasn't taken care of, if something wasn't done, it would bring incredible shame and it would bring dishonor upon your name. So when Mary looks at Jesus and says, they have no more wine, this is really a big deal. Now, your wedding, say you run out of cocktail wieners or there's not enough punch or, or whatever you have at your wedding, people walk away and they're like, well, I'm sad I didn't get one of those cocktail wieners. That's not the thing. I mean, this is a big deal. People will go on and they'll live. But in this situation, when Mary looks at Jesus and says, they have no more wine, this means that ultimately this couple, their first argument in their marriage was this moment right here. Can't you just hear it? Like the bride is looking at the groom and saying, I took care of all the details. Your only job was to stock the bar and you couldn't do it. So they run out of wine. So Mary looks at Jesus and makes this observation. Now, is she asking Jesus to do something? Perhaps. But I think greater, Mary sees this couple, she sees the shame that's gonna fall on this couple that's gonna carry them for a very long time and she's ultimately worried and she tells her eldest son, she tells Jesus, they have no more wine. Now, how does Jesus respond? 
he says, verse four, woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. He starts with the word woman. (laughs) If I had ever looked at my mother and started with the word woman, I got to say this. This is true. I love the smell of Irish spring soap. But I may be speaking from experience when I say it does not taste well at all. So you hear this and you're like, is Jesus getting sassy with his mother to like open with the word woman? How many of you think that sounds like he's just kind of getting a little sassy with his mom? It's actually not the case at all. Now, kids, you want to be like Jesus in every way possible. Don't open ever with your parents with like woman. Don't do that. Because it was a cultural thing that Jesus was doing. He would actually say this several times. In fact, what? On the cross, he looks at his mother and he says, woman. It's a sign of authority. It's a sign of respect. So he says, woman, why do you involve me in this? Now, he's not being insensitive. But there's something deeper that Jesus is saying here that when you really kind of dig into it, you get this this deeper thing. This couple has great shame and dishonor that's on them. He says, why do you involve me in this? In other words, like this doesn't intersect with with the greater calling that I have on my life. In fact, he says this. Listen, this is so interesting. He says, my hour has not yet come. What does that mean, my hour? You know, any time Jesus would use the word hour in relationship to his ministry, his time in this earth, he was referring to the crucifixion. He was referring to the moment that he would go to the cross. So it's as if in this moment he sees the shame that's fallen upon this family and he sees that this is a big thing for them, but he sees a greater picture for the shame that ultimately covers humanity and what he came to do. So I love in this moment, Jesus says, my hour has not yet come. I get the shame on them, but listen, I've got a bigger perspective. I've got a bigger calling. You don't see it now, but when it comes, it's gonna make all the impact. It's a whole recalculating moment for everyone in the world. Well, then why do you involve me? For my hour has not yet come. And look at what his mother says. This is so good, I love this part. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you to do. That's really good, isn't it? See, mama's gonna find a way to make sure you do what she wants you to do. You understand that? Like, I love that this this is the only time that Mary would actually instruct Jesus to do something. This is the only time you see it. But she doesn't say it to Jesus. She tells the servants, you do whatever he tells you to do. If you don't hear anything else this morning, please let this sink in for just a moment. What if the first step to a greater miracle in your life begins with this? Do whatever he tells you to do. What if that's the first step? What if that's it? What if that's where your miracle, whatever that thing is, that thing that you're lacking in your life, that that stain that's on you, what if the first step is to do whatever he tells you to do? I'm not great at math, but I do love this equation. Nothing plus Jesus with an addition of willingness and obedience and action in faith equals abundantly more every single time. I love that. Mary says, do whatever he tells you to do. Well, there it is. How's Jesus gonna respond? Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the, say that word, Okay, Jesus sees there are six stone jars that are sitting here at this wedding. They were for ceremonial washing. You have to understand the culture. I mean, all the way through the Old Testament, there were these Levitical laws of of how you were called to to purify yourself. Um, In Mark chapter seven, I think it's verse two, it says that the Pharisees, they never really ate because they were always washing themselves. This is something that you would use these jars in order to cleanse yourself because you were filthy, because you were dirty. There were these ceremonial 
purification rites that people would go through. God was gracious. God was merciful. But these are things that you had to do for yourself in order to be cleansed. Irony that Jesus would perform this miracle and the very things that people had to do for themselves that Jesus was about to do for humanity. Why did John say six stone jars? Why is the number six there? Is it a coincidence that the number six in the Bible, anytime you see the number six, six means mankind, humanity? That Jesus would take these six jars and ultimately by making the water turn into wine, he's doing something greater. The number seven is, is whole. It's completion. It's perfection. Jesus says, bring me those six jars and I want you to fill them up with water. Now, now when we read scripture, everything's just flat, right? Everything happens super fast. Do you know how long it would take to take these jars and to fill them up? It would have taken a really long time. But these come back, right? They come back and they are filled to the brim. I love the servants. They go so far beyond what Jesus said to do. They fill them to the top so absolutely nothing else can go in. And then he said, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. Think wedding coordinator. Take it to the master of the banquet, the one that's really panicking because there's no more wine in the house. Well, they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine and he didn't realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. And then he called the bridegroom aside. Bridegroom comes over and listen to what he told him. Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best until now. This is great for so many reasons. Number one, he just told the bridegroom that your wine that you had was cheap. Like, <laughs> like two buck chuck. Like your wine was so cheap. But he said, I love what you did here because I just tasted this new wine that you had brought in and you saved the best till last. Now what did the bridegroom know that the wedding coordinator didn't know? That wasn't his wine. He had absolutely no idea where this wine came from. But you know what he did in this moment? He went, yep, that's exactly how I roll. Like he totally took credit for it. I love this. You know what I love about this miracle? A lot of people didn't even have a clue where it came from. A lot of people didn't have a clue what was going on. But Jesus did. He's saying something greater, that, that I'm coming to take ordinary things and to fill them to the full and to bring something rich and something glorious out of it. That's what he's doing. So John would say in verse 11, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed him. First thing I want to say, revealing his glory means that we need to accept and understand once and for all that he takes away our shame. When my son, Nick, was two years old, my, my wife called me and she said, I remember, she said, you need to come home and see what your son has done. Anytime he did something that was a little weird or ADHD, all of a sudden he became my son. Isn't that sweet? So I come home, and I, she wouldn't tell me what happened, but I come home, and when I see my little boy at two years old, I brought a picture, this is, this is what I see. Now let me explain this. I cropped it for you, because he's here today. I cropped it, that's too much pressure for him. You're welcome. And he's seeing this for the first time right now. Nikki had put him down for a nap in our bedroom. He'd fallen asleep. And in the little table next to our bed, um, I had a black permanent Sharpie marker that was in that table. And Nicholas had apparently woken up. We had a, a black cat at the time by the name of Charlie. And Nicholas wanted to look just like Charlie. God bless him. So he took that black permanent Sharpie marker and he proceeded to color himself, all of himself, black. And I come home. Nick. And he's like, 
I'm Charlie. And I'm like, yeah, you've got permanent marker on you. So we begin to just try and wash that off and nothing is happening. And Nick's like, why is it not coming off, Daddy? And I said, you used permanent marker. He's like, what does that mean? And me being the not so great parent that I am, I said, forever. Like, it's on there forever. And he's like, I don't want to be forever. Crying. And you guys, this was the archaic ages of the 1990s. Siri was not there to help. In my day, the Encyclopedia Britannica, you had to like, there was nowhere we could go. We start calling people. And of all things, of all things, I think it was off insect repellent, wasn't it? That someone, there was a swimmer and they used Sharpie on them and we were able, so praise the Lord, it was gone. Jesus taking these stone jars, he, he's, he's retraining the mindset of people. Like when we understand what he did on the cross for us, like people are just rubbing and their stuff's not coming off and they don't think they're ever going to be clean enough or good enough or forgiven enough to be loved by God. Are we any different today? How many of us, we just come to the cross and we lay it down, but then we pick it up and we take it right back with us. But Paul says, in Romans chapter 8, I love what the Apostle Paul says. He says this, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. So when John says he came to reveal his glory, that Jesus went to the cross, died a sinner's death, so that we could be free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is, someone say it, freedom. There is freedom. I love that it's not a coincidence. These stone jars, Jesus would use this to paint a bigger truth that we move into this Advent season to celebrate that he came in, that this was his purpose, this was his plan so that we might know freedom. And do we live in that? Do we believe that? Like when Paul, I, I wrote this this week, when Paul says in Ephesians chapter three, verse 20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power at work within us, do we live with that mindset? Do we believe Jesus? In John 10.10, 10, when he looked at his disciples, he said, look, the enemy comes to lie, kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come so that you might have life and you might have it abundantly. I mean, ultimately, church, here's where I fall in my life. I mean, this miracle of Jesus turning the water into the wine, the, the symbolism, right? The, the cup when he takes the wine and, and, and he says, do this. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do we take this gift in our own life and are we guilty of turning wine into water? I mean, that, that's been my conviction this week. Are, are we guilty of, of taking this grace and all that God has done and watering down the blood of Jesus Christ so that it's just, it's, it's, it's empty and it holds no power because that's not why he came and it's not why he died. There's incredible power in that. And if you wrestle with that, if you wrestle with the flesh and the law, you're in great company because the dude who wrote two-thirds of the letters in the New Testament, Paul struggled with it all the time. Last one, band's gonna come up and we're gonna wrap it up here. But. So how do you do it? How do you live a life <laughs> full of the Spirit? How do you live a life connected to the Spirit? I think Paul, Paul addresses it well and here's how we end. Paul says to the church of Ephesus, right, this letter, the, the church was turning on itself and they were, they were backbiting and they were arguing and they were following false teachings and they weren't loving each other well anymore. They were becoming more like the world and not in the world, but of the world. They were becoming more like the world. So Paul says, be very careful how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. You know what Jesus Christ has done. He, he walks through the book of Ephesians. Read the whole book. It'll take you 30 minutes, maybe at most. He lays out the foundation. He says, knowing what Christ has done, be careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity. There's that obedience. There's that stepping into faith when the burning bush happens because he says the days, the days are evil. 
He's not saying the world is bad, but there is bad in the world. So therefore, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Listen, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Those of you that love to like use the water to wine because woo -woo, God loves to keep a party going, drink responsibly, church. This is what Paul says. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. But instead, here's how he ends it. Be filled with the Spirit. You know, that's what I love. When you tap into the Spirit at work in your life, when you understand that God fills us with his spirit, that his spirit is just abundant and it's rich. When you live into that spirit, when you're obedient to that spirit's movement in your life, you better bet that you're gonna see immeasurably more than you could ever think or imagine according to the power that is at work within. So let me pray for you now. Father, I'm grateful God, I'm grateful that you show up and that you show up every single day. Father, for the statement early on, the very first miracle that we see where you take water and you turn it into wine, you're communicating a much bigger gift that you're giving to humanity. Jesus stayed the course. He went to the cross and it wasn't our shame and our sin that held him there. It was, it was his love for us, God. It's your love for us. So Lord, we're moving into a, a season and I feel like it's just gonna get busier, it's gonna get louder, it's gonna get noisier. But Father, calm our hearts. Let's tap into the spirit that's at work within. And Jesus, just continue to follow us, continue to lead us. Holy Spirit, thank you for the power that you make available to us every single day. God, let's accept that grace. Let's accept that mercy. Wash us, Father what you've done, for what you're doing, and for what you're going to do. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. And it's in your name that we say, 